I really want to talk about this, frankly, embarrassing interview that Prime Minister Justin Trudeau did on Stephen Colbert's late night show yesterday. It was both bad for Trudeau himself as well as Canada as a country. Because if Americans see this as like our leader, the sort of person that our country elects, yeah, not good for Canada's stock. Canada's stock is going down if Americans think that this is somebody that a significant portion of us actually approve of. I don't want to belabor this thing too much. I just want to jump in and talk about a few sections. This was just, in my opinion, a terrible interview. Trudeau obviously only showed up because Stephen Colbert was willing to give him mostly a back rub of an interview. Why are you so progressive and wise? Why is Pierre Polyev so far right and fascistic? All this sort of nonsense. But I just want to note before I start playing clips from this thing, look at the title of this video, the upload that the Stephen Colbert show did. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Canada's Trump and the rise of far-right xenophobia in Canada. Like, goodness, people. Can we get a grip of ourselves? Is that is that an actual fair take on what's going on in Canada? Or is that just what the legacy media does on both sides of the border? Oh, you're conservative? Oh, you're far right. Oh, you're the new Trump. Because Trump's far right and evil because stuff. Reasons. Reasons. Even though, like, what's he going to do? Like, lower taxes? What's what's Pierre Pauly going to do? Lower taxes? Lower immigration? Okay. People, people approve of those policies. At the end of the day, whether something's on the right or left, it's just policy positions. That's all it is. But people like to boil it down into like, oh, it's like evil or something like that. I don't agree with left-wing policy positions. Most of them are not evil. They're just dumb. And I can explain why. But so many lefties turn everything into like, oh, that's disgusting and dark, rather than being able to say, well, I don't agree with lowering taxes for this and that reason, or I don't think the immigration rate has to fall down for this or that reason. They can't argue that because they would lose. But anyways, here's Justin Trudeau on Stephen Colbert's show getting some nice softballs about the UN. The UN comes together, you know, every year as a, a, a reminder, as, as, as we look at all the issues that are brought to the UN General Assembly and the speeches of the different world leaders that go there. Um, does the UN General Assembly every year make you more or less hopeful? Like, are you reminded of the challenges or the possibilities more? My goodness, what kind of question is that? And this is what I mean by saying that Stephen Colbert makes a fool of himself in his interview. He looks bad. That Who cares about the UN? This is such a weird, elitist bubble kind of a question. So the UN General Assembly met recently, and is it making you feel hopeful? Are you feeling like, you know, like are you feeling like uplifted by the UN speeches? Nobody watches the UN. Nobody does other than people like Justin Trudeau and Christian Freeland and people who put like 10 flags in their bios. Nobody cares what happens to the UN because it's an irrelevant organization. Every time people follow recommendations, policy recommendations from the UN, things get worse. Just look at UNDRIP. Just look at a lot of the green policies that are now destroying Europe and parts of like, you know, Canada because everyone thinks that oil and gas is now evil while China keeps building more coal plants and we keep divesting ourselves from natural gas. But anyways, I'll, I will let Justin Trudeau get to the answer here. Obviously both, but you have to be fundamentally hopeful in, 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 this, in this job and particularly in this time where it's, it's, the, the, the challenges are monumental. We don't have to list them. Um, but if you don't believe that you can actually you know, work with others and make a positive difference, then you're not on the right line of work. I mean, people elect us, send us into office for the time we're in to try and have the best impact on you know, how the world is unfolding for them. And if you're not convinced that you can make a positive difference, uh, then you're not on the right line of work. I will say it's good. It's good that you want to get into politics to make a positive difference. I'm going to posit that after nine years, if things have gotten worse, I don't care if that you're convinced yourself that you're trying to make a positive difference. I care about results. You know, pen and paper, can we actually figure out if people are better off at the end of the day after nine years of their leadership? That's a better metric. But like Trudeau wants to talk about vagaries around, you know, well, you got to really want to care about, you got to want to care about people in this line of work. You want to make a positive difference. No, 
No, all the people in the UN who are, or when I say people in the UN, I know some people show up and speak and they don't really care about it. Like there's a lot of world leaders who just show up and frankly dunk on a lot of the other members of the UN because the UN is a joke organization that uplifts irrelevant countries and dictatorships and pretends they're on the level with countries like the United Kingdom, USA, and Canada. But uh, it, no, this is just fluff garbage. This is, I don't know who would like watch this and say, oh, he did such a great job. But I did save people who are like big Trudeau cheerleaders saying like, oh, he did such a great job in Stephen Colbert. Who who watch, listens to this answer? What undecided voter in Canada watches this answer says, give him another four years. Come on, give the, give the boy his four years. He's still convinced he can get the job done. Well... And after. Here's one thing, you know, it's something that I'm sure that has come, comes, you know, quite uh, uh, clearly when the UN General Assembly is that uh, the far right uh, and you know, flirtations with fascism, at the very least, is rising across the globe. Even in Canada, your conservative party leader, your opponent there, has been called Canada's Trump. And I'm sorry about that. And... How much did how much did Justin Trudeau pay this guy to say this stuff? Like what? Oh, well, he cuts. They want strength in the military. They want lower immigration rates, lower immig illegal immigration rates. It's like okay, our personality wise, they're really not the same person. Same policies, sure, but those policies are popular. So what's your actual point here, Stephen? This is where Stephen is looking like a massive shill and fool. But I'm curious why. Um at least some form of nativism or uh, far-right xenophobia might grow in a country even as polite as Canada. Why do you think this is getting a foothold even in your country? But, and can Stephen Colbert and Justin Trudeau, can they define what does xenophobia mean to you? Xenopho like, do you? Are you talking about having problems with 500,000 new permanent residents per year entering the country, plus temporary foreign workers and students. You know, I've sat down with a lot of South Asian people in British Columbia since I'm here helping with the BC Conservatives in the British Columbia provincial election. South Asian voters don't like how high immigration is. They find it annoying. They don't, they don't, it's just because the people who are coming into Canada are heavily coming from places like Punjab and the rest of India doesn't mean that they're affiliated with them. If anything, that's one of the most racist things you could possibly posit to somebody that, Oh, well, you must want more of these people because they look like you. No, they're not part of their family. They don't They don't owe these people anything. Just as if we had a bunch of people showing up from Romania, just hundreds of thousands of Romanians, I wouldn't be like, well, I am kind of look like a Romanian person, so I'm cool with these people. That's not how that works at all, at all whatsoever. You see, that phrase, even in Canada, I mean, we're, we're not some magical place of unicorns and rainbows all the time. We got more than our fair share. But... Like the things that we've managed to do, um, we've had to work really, really hard at. I mean, you know, universal health care was, a, you know, decades of trying to build, bring people together and make it happen. We've, we've moved forward on, on you know, world-leading uh, uh, fight against climate change with a price on pollution. We're moving forward with, with dental care for, for low-income Canadians. Uh, we're moving forward with $10 a day child care. These are things that we have to fight for and that are really hard to do, but they haven't worked, you know, scoozy, but they haven't worked, dude. They're like actually failed programs or like you haven't actually lowered raw emissions or even emissions per capita were already going down for decades before you got into office. Like, I don't even know what to say to any of this. But you can bring people together around thoughtful ideas and you can also lose those things too. I mean, there's a there's a big argument right now about whether whether dental care even exists. We've delivered it to 700,000 people across the country, and my opponent is gaslighting us and saying, "Oh, dental care doesn't even exist yet." How many? Be, yeah, like the thing that the the liberals have honestly been cooking the numbers around dental care. When the program was only like a few months old, they're like, "Well, we delivered dental care to a million people." It's like, yeah, a million people who qualify for dental care because it's pretty much everyone, had gone to a dentist. But most people who are going to the dentist and are probably people who already had a dental plan. The thing is that, and I'm not trying to like underplay how much some dental care plans can cost, but overall, 
like if dental care costs a lot to you, it's probably just because the economy sucks and the government's taking so much money away from you that the 30 bucks a month to have full dental care is considered a lot of money. But the people who go for dental care still are the people who cared about dental care and purchased dental care. There's a lot of people who don't have dental care who could easily afford it. They are like they make hundreds of thousands a year. They just don't value dental care and they don't use it. And that's why we're able to cook numbers because we're like a million people you, like who qualified for dental care got dental care, but they were disproportionately the people who already had plans. So it's actually not worked at all. And there's not that many dentists who are willing to take the government plans. How many times have you been elected as prime minister? Uh, it's three times. Too many. It's in a row. Three yeah. times in a row. Okay. And that's the record, right? There's one other person has done. Has no, anyone been four? It, my, my father was four, but there was a break in the oh, middle. Oh, but not contiguously. Not uh, contiguously. You have to go back a, a pretty long uh, like Stephen Colbert thinks like it's like a, the record to get three. Uh, like I, maybe it's just like, I guess Americans don't really follow Canadian politics that much and nor I guess should they, cause it's kind of boring, but like, no, like, you know, William Lyon, Mackenzie King had like five, I think. Uh, how many did like John A. McDonald have? A lot of these people had tons of terms, loads of terms. I think Laurie must have at least had three. So yeah, like saying like, Oh, is that a record? It's just, yeah, no, it's not. Be long way uh, for for peace. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I had a dilemma right there. The AC started uh, started up right next to me. I'm not sure if people can hear that in the mic, and that would have been annoying. But I'll let I'll let Justin Trudeau and Stephen Colbert keep nattering about stuff here. Heading into next year's election, your party has lost some seats in Parliament. Uh, your party is 17 points behind in the polls, and this week you're wrong. <laughs> even even Stephen has to mention how bad the polling is. Uh, at least they strategically grabbed a poll where they weren't 22 points underwater because there are those that exist. And actually, I believe the average lead these days for the conservatives is like 20 points. 17 is borderline an outlier. That's like the nice polls where the liberals are getting like 25% and then like the conservatives are getting like 43 or whatever. It, it's not been fun out there. Rivals are calling a vote to possibly force you out of office. Mm -hmm. um, give that the devil- Force an election. Force an election, okay, yeah. so force an election. Uh, snap election, I believe it's called, mm -hmm. is that true? I love that. Yeah. Um, give the devil his due, what's their rationale? What would you imagine a reasonable argument for their complaints is? Um, well, that it's a really tough time in Canada right now. People, people are hurting. People are having trouble paying for groceries, paying for- This is gonna make a great conservative ad. I already see it. This is gonna make a great conservative ad. But, you know, what's what's Justin Trudeau's Canada like? And then just play this five second clip. Rent, uh, filling up the tank. Uh, there's a lot of comparable to what's happening in the United States, yeah, like a similar situation. Similar. Some, some of the things are a little trickier in, in Canada where we, we lost a little ground over the past decades on building housing. So the housing crisis is, is uh, a little sharper. Our economic outlook is slightly more positive than the United States right now on a macro level. But people don't feel it when they're buying for groceries. So there's a lot of frustration. And that's one of the reasons why, even though... And, and Siri, but he basically just said something here that always drives him up the wall. Whenever the liberals say, well, the economy is growing, the GDP is up. I'm like, yeah, more warm bodies, more people are entering the country. You couldn't have a single human being enter a country and not add to the economy unless they literally have zero dollars to their names. They're not going to work and they just want benefits. That's not a person that exists. Everyone comes with an inherent small amount of wealth at the very least. And they usually do some work, even at the bare minimum, they add to the economy. Sure. But, and then he just admitted there that, yeah, no matter what we've been doing, which is just trying to pump the raw GDP, people's actual purchasing power is going down. Per capita GDP is going down. And he's acting like this is like a mystery. Look, people aren't feeling the economic benefits of the grocery store. Well, of course. Yes, if everyone had a dollar in their pocket who was entering the country and we had a trillion of them enter the country, yes, the GDP technically just went up if they spend those dollars by one trillion. But are we actually then better off as per capita incomes hit the floor and, you know, everything like all of our programs become completely stretched? There's no jobs, all that stuff. Obviously not. Hyperbolic example, but the hyperbole is to <laughs> demonstrate a point here. Our economy is, by sort of macro metrics, doing very well. We're saying, okay, even if it's doing well macro, let's invest more in people. Let's move forward on $10 a day child care right across the country. Let's move forward on dental care. Let's move forward on, on pharma care. So diabetes medication and prescription contraceptives will be free. These are the kinds of things that we're, we're 
investing in so people can actually get a relief and have more money to pay for groceries or, or what have you. I'm just going to end it there because you don't need to watch the entire interview through me here. But like, that's such a terrible answer. Oh, like we, people aren't feeling the, the the major economic growth that we have. So we're going to invest in contraceptives like guys. Yeah, I guess for some people. And if you could have just made it a, a, a plan for low income seniors or low income people in general to give them cheap diabetes medication in terms of like heavily subsidized diabetes medication. Fair enough. It was a low income program. I could say yes to it. But y nobody's going to be like suddenly like, man, the economy sucked. But then I started getting free contraceptives. This place is great. Nobody thinks like this. But he thinks that people think like this. Every once in a while, somebody will comment at me, whether in person or uh, like, you know, online, talking about how, well, Trudeau knows what he's doing. He has a plan to win this next election. They're not Trudeau cheerleaders. They're very much the opposite. They hate Justin Trudeau's guts. They just assume that Justin Trudeau has a grand plan to like buy off voters or something like that. And, you know, you get a lot of parties that genuinely try and do that in terms of they announce a big amount of spending and I'm going to give you a thousand dollars. You know, we have a big rebate program that will give you a thousand dollars if you vote for us. And it's like not they're not giving them a rebate for any reasons, basically just sending people checks like the B.C. conservatives actually have a great plan that actually makes sense to give people the ability to write off a large portion of their rent costs and mortgage costs per month off of their income taxes, it'd be a great tax cut for a lot of people because people at the lower end of the income spectrum don't pay a lot of provincial income tax, but this would actually probably result in them getting a full on rebate, uh, not just paying less taxes. So that's a good policy because it's actually giving people back their own money that they gave to the government. Some people are trying to display this like, oh, that would cost 3.5 billion. It doesn't cost any money to give people their own money back. I hate the stupid talking point that tax cuts will cost five billion. Oh, on the national level, a poly of cutting this whatever would cost this much. No, it doesn't cost anything to cut taxes. The other garbage we spend on does cost money. And when I say garbage, I mean like DEI programs, the bloat of HR and administration, a lot of other just initiatives that don't do anything for anybody. It just creates fake jobs in the federal government. And I'm very serious about that fake jobs there is a reason why in the federal government they have the joke of working for club fed like club med because it's so easy to work many of these jobs you you can just like file a couple of reports in a week about nothing nobody's gonna read them you get paid massive amounts of money to do it you don't even have to come into the office more than three times a week these days it's insane you can work from home and just play tetris or whatever and then they pass this ridiculous new policy of like, you know, workers, uh, some workers' rights policy, and it only applies to federally regulated workers. And it says, you don't have to, like, you don't have to stay, like, a manager cannot make you stay late at work to complete tasks or whatever. And it's like, what? Yes, because the a lot of these federal employees, and I'm sure some of them are working super hard, no doubt. Some of them actually do have real jobs in government because there are base level jobs that we do need to be filled. But a lot of these positions, like what scenario is this? Hey, boss man, you can't make me stay back at work and play another game of Tetris. Hey, I get to go home. I, I you know, I, like I can't keep burning the candle at both ends here. I got to go recharge by doing the same thing I was doing at work, but at home. I got to watch some Netflix at home. I don't get it. Anyways, but I want to quickly bring up, to not make this too rambly, I want to quickly bring up this um, post that someone made about the Colbert interview that I just saw found was so intriguing that somebody actually posted this, uh, Deborah Gibson here. And it's not like this isn't a major person, like, like you know, go, don't at this person and go after them. But I saw so many people posting stuff like this. Most of the comments of this are positive saying, oh yeah, he did do a great job. Deborah G Gibson here saying, our prime minister was effing fantastic on Stephen Colbert. What do you mean by fantastic? Like, I what is your definition of fantastic here? You ha you can have your opinion. I get it. Have your own opinion about how uh, how Trudeau did. But like, even if you're a liberal cheerleader or you want the liberals to win, I don't. I'm a conservative. I want the conservatives to win and do as many very conservative things as possible. That doesn't make Trudeau look good. This is kind of like every time. And I'm not trying to get too much into American politics just because I want this 
channel will be very Canadian in orientation. Whenever people be like, oh, Kamala Harris just did a great interview on whatever show. And you watch it and you're like, you have to watch this interview through the lens of a moderate. When I say moderate, not that they don't have strong opinions about everything. Moderates often have strong opinions, but just about slightly different things than uh, a party partisan would. So like, you know, a Republican has very conservative opinions on pretty much everything and a democrat has more liberal opinions on everything and then moderates will have conservative opinions on some things and very liberal opinions on other things uh, Aaron O'Toole's conception that moderates don't have strong opinions about things is stupid but whatever uh not to go down too many rabbit holes here but they'll be like oh Kamal Harris did so well and you're like watch the interview for a lot of moderate voters that was rambly wasn't giving them clear answers on things and they because they're not a partisan cheerleader don't know what you're talking about. Same thing that happens with Trump too, where he'll do an interview where it probably didn't do him any favors. It didn't win over any people he wasn't already having on his side. And people will be like, oh, that was a great interview. It wasn't. It wasn't because you have to achieve a goal with an interview. I don't know what goal Justin Trudeau was hoping to achieve with this interview. I guess he wanted to look like the, the fashionable prime minister. Oh, look, oh, he's going on all the late night shows. Who's in Canada? was planning on voting for the conservatives 45 percent of the country in some polls was going to say well, i'll go back liberal because of this nobody not a single person they talked about the un and how oh how hopeful does the un make you feel does it does it really cause a glow in your heart to 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 be at the un prime minister trudeau oh yes it really does and we got to talk about serious issues and like pure polyev is far right and xenophobic or whatever it's just tired crap Anyways, that's it for me today, guys. If you want to fund the uh, legal fund that we have in the description below, that would be greatly appreciated. I've spent more than $33,000 now defending the National Telegraph in court from this Chinese billionaire suing us for defamation, which in almost three years now, he actually hasn't filed any evidence to substantiate. His evidence is his LinkedIn profile. His company website, which I guess show that he's such a great guy, why would your guest writer even mention anything bad about me, even though everything we mentioned was uh, was based on a Globe and Mail article? We basically reported nothing new. And then he added in our libel, his libel notice he sent to us, which doesn't mean anything. He basically, a libel notice is basically just this, hey, stop that. There's no actual evidence in the libel notice. It's just basically saying, I'm taking issue with you saying this. And then his... Then the article we wrote, that was his evidence. It was like nothing. And he still hasn't even gotten back to us on a bunch of things we asked for during his deposition. But whatever, I guess. I, you know, Cal Alberta doesn't have anti-slap legislation, which means these things can go on for years. And that's what's happened. So if you guys want to donate, it's in the description below. Give, send, go. As well as pinned in the comments below. Just a bit of a longerish video. Sorry about that. Or maybe that's what you like. I don't know. I don't know your life. I don't know what you like or dislike. Uh, but hopefully you'll like this video, you know, like, share and subscribe, do all those things, smooth transition. Uh, see you guys later.